first of all, we have to understand that angels are spirits. Does everyone understand that? Um, demons are spirits, right? Does, anybody, does everyone understand that? They're not separate things. God is spirit and all things are emanations of God. But what you when you say demon, and we're gonna talk about what demons are, they're demons that comes from the Greek era. Um, they're titles. Angel is a messenger, but he is a spirit, right? And there are different kinds of these, the seraph, which is a different kind of angel. Uh, the cherubim, a different kind of angel. Uh, the demon, which the Greek uh, knew as daemon, uh, which is a another word for spirit, but it's also a word for personified spirit, which like I said, we're talking about. Um, all of these things are spirit, uh, just like you, right? Just like you. So for example, and I didn't even put the verse on here, but I'll go off the top of the head. In the Bible, when God created humans, if you remember, your flesh is from the dirt. You're from the dirt. To, to the dirt you will return, right? But what does he do? He breathes the spirit of life into you. An em emanation of him. Now you could say, well, that's the Holy Spirit. Oh, is it? Is that the Holy Spirit that he breathed into you in the creation? No, because then you'd have to say that the Holy Spirit went for us. Why did we need the Holy Spirit later? So it is another personified spirit, the spirit of life. They came into you and all of these spirits are emanations of God, but they can go bad. And to say they can't would be like, you guys should have just been perfect then from day one and never changed. <laughs> you would have to say that, why did Satan, who is an angel, become corrupt? So these, all these emanations are emanations of God because God is spirit, right? He's the creator. And they're all emanations from God who is spirit, not the flesh. That's from the dirt. It says so. Every single thing working in this world are spirits. And we interact with them even when you don't know it. And we're going to break all of that down. And I'm going to prove it uh, with scripture as well as some outside text too. I would also argue two things are likely what's happening. A, you're either summoning them and don't even know it by your actions or you're actually producing them. And what do I mean? There are certain spirits in the Bible that are called unclean spirits, right? And if you look at their traits, they're traits of man. They're not traits of God. Spirit of sickness, spirit of blind, mute, spirit of jealousy, spirit of lies. These, are, these aren't traits of God, right? Like this, Like you could say the spirit of wisdom is a trait of God, right? But you couldn't call the spirit of liars a trait of God, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't spirits that went corrupt and became that. So what I'm saying is that it could be either or. And why is that important? Because when you go into the world and, and you get into an argument or, or you're doing something that is unclean to God, right? That isn't in the nature of God. You potentially are creating or summoning a, a, a one of these personified spirits, right? And then what are they gonna do when you create that personified spirit? They're gonna create a personified spirit back. So you create a spirit, a personified spirit of anger, right? And then his reaction is, well, excuse me, personified spirit of pride. Oh, well, this isn't how it works, Matt. Really? What does the Bible say? Your battle is not with flesh and blood. So what are you doing? Right? Your battle is not with flesh and blood. Nowhere in the Bible does it say your battle is with flesh and blood. It says it's with spirits. And I, and I didn't pull the verse up, but everyone knows the verse, Ephesians, right? Your battle is not with flesh and blood. Your battle is with all of these personified spirits, spirits of sickness, anger, pride, et cetera, et cetera. And when you go out into the world and you start, nah, 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 you are summoning or producing, ever heard of the term? And we'll use it in a scientific term. We'll use it in a more worldly term. Oh, you're giving off bad vibes. Hello? <laughs> You're, you're producing, you're putting out these bad spirits, and then this person's gonna act to it, right? He's gonna, oh, excuse me? There is no battle between us. Now these, this is why it's called a spiritual battle. That's <laughs> the point. You're actually participating. What does Jesus say? Turn the other cheek. What does that mean? That means you're stepping out of participation. If you turn the other cheek, you're not participating in producing these things that are taking place, right? So I would argue that that's what's taking place. And I'm gonna pretty much prove what's taking place as we go. And this is gonna get deeper because it's gonna go right out to the end, uh, end of times, right to where, uh, how all this plays apart. So let's start at Babylon because that's where all this starts. That's where all of this stems from is Babylon. Uh, and I'm gonna show you what I mean. Uh, we'll just take a look at this real quick. This is the History Channel, 
what the History Channel has to say about Babylon. Uh, and we'll just, I'm gonna graze over it just to show you a couple points. The city of Babylon was located about 50 miles south of Baghdad uh, along Euphrates River in present day Iraq, uh, which also means uh, that it's south, that Babylon is uh, South Mesopotamia. So you guys are familiar with Mesopotamia, and you are, we've discussed it. Uh, Enki, Enlil, and these are the oldest gods on paper, right? So this is where it all stems from. Uh, the city of Babylon was located about 50 miles south of Baghdad along the Euphrates River in present-day Iraq. It was founded around 2300 BC uh, by the ancient Akkadian-speaking people of southern Mesopotamia. Babylon became a major military power under the Amorite king Hammurabi. If you don't know who Hammurabi is, I highly recommend if you ever have time to do a study on Hammurabi. He's got the Hammurabi, uh, the, the, the king's list, not the king's list, the Hammurabi law, or the law, the law of Hammurabi, which is literally the written law. The, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not, in Babylon, this is way before Mount Sinai, this is way before the Hammurabi law, look it up, I highly recommend it, uh, conquered neighboring city-states, he brought much southern and central Mesopotamia under a uh, unified Babylon rule, creating an, emperor called ba uh, creating an empire called Babylonia. Now, another thing, we're going to skip a little bit here uh, to point out here, right here, everyone's familiar with that, right? Everyone's heard of that, Tower of Babel, right? Uh, the city of Babylon appears in both Hebrew and Christian scriptures. Script Christian scriptures portray Babylon as a wicked city. Hebrew scriptures tell the story of the Babylonian exile portraying Nebuchadnezzar as a captor. Famous accounts of Babylon in the Bible include the story of the Tower of Babel. According to the Old Testament story, humans tried to build a tower to reach the heavens. When God saw this, let me tell you what was going on in Babylon. They were creating a one world government. So what we see in Babylon is that this is where really the foundation of all of this starts at. This is where all these different entities come into play, uh, the beginnings of your one world government, uh, all that jazz. So, it's a general idea on Babylon. We're gonna take a look at some of these personified spirits that come out of Babylon. So one of the first ones we're gonna look at is Tiamat. Uh, Tiamat is the personification of saltwater ocean. So we'll just pop this up real quick just to get a thing here. Tiamat, goddess. Tiamat is a personification of the primordial sea from which the gods were first created. She is also the main adversary of Marduk and Enuma Elish. And I'm not going to go too deep into Tiamat because I have a lot of these to show you, but I'm going to show you how there's some relationship here with the Bible. And, I, and it, it's, I'm going to show you how this works because none of this is fake. The things that I'm showing you aren't fake entities. They are real entities that God is the God of, and he authorizes these spirits to do different things, right? So let's go here, um, let's see. Tiamat is a myth, which we've already proven even in the Nephilim that they're not myth, right? They call the, 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 the Titans myth, but we call them the Nephilim. Do we believe in this or is it all myth to us? <laughs> so let's go a little deeper here. Ample reference outside of New Middle East against the description, primeval seas, the salt sea, uh, which is Tiamat, and the sweet sea, Abzu. So these two primordial, the salt water and the fresh water, are united, right? This is what we're seeing. I know, I know, I'm talking quick, and you guys have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm not, I'm not saying don't challenge it. I'm saying don't challenge it without doing your homework. You see what I'm saying? Don't challenge it without doing your homework. Okay. So, but because of time, I'm not going to break everything down. So, go do your homework if you feel you need to challenge it. Uh, Tiamat is the salt water. Abzu is the fresh water. Uh, their waters were mingling. Uh, and then a story comes into play where Marduk comes along and he defeats Tiamat, splitting the sea in half. And guess what happens? The top half becomes the firmament and the bottom half becomes the earth. Any of this not familiar? What did God do in Genesis where he split the waters in half and the top half became the firmament and the bottom half became the earth? That is literally the ancient Sumerian story that we see here with Tiamat, who is the literal personification of that water. But then you get the story in, in, in the Bible where it doesn't, it doesn't, hang on these entities. Uh, she is ultimately defeated by Marduk who incapitates her with his evil wind. Anyone know what wind is in Hebrew? Spirit. Did you know that? Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't even put that on here, but I, I should have. Uh, this is a personified, right? A personified wind. Right? It's all the same things. I'm, and I could show you, but I, we have so much to go through. Um, I will end up showing you before it's over. Uh, and kills, then kills her with an arrow, but watch as Marduk splits her in two, creating heaven and earth from the body. The and then the Tigris 
and the Euphrates from her eyes and from the mist of the spittle, the mountains. Tigris Euphrates, where's that at? That's literally where Eden is. Let's go, let's go back into the... Why are these connected? Because they're all true, but we just, we need to know who we're supposed to be worshiping. And this is where people fall off. This is where all the ancients fell off. We're going to worship that spirit. We're going to worship that spirit. Or we're going to worship all these spirits, right? That's kind of what took place. So that's Tiamat. That's the first one we'll look at. She comes from Babylon, uh, Mesopotamia. There's some others. Aya, she's the goddess of light. Ninasana, uh, goddess of Venus. Uh, Nidaba, goddess of grain and writing. Uh, Lamashtu, uh, known as the baby killer demon, but we're not going to hit that just yet. The one I skipped is Ishtar because she's the big dog. So we see all these. These are all Babylon spirits. You notice one thing that's very familiar here. Uh, have you noticed that all of these are women? We're, we're back to that again, right? We're back to they're all women. Tiamat is a female goddess, goddess. Uh, Ishtar, we're going to look into her a little deeper, goddess of sexual love, Aya, goddess of light, Ninasana, goddess of Venus, goddess of grain and writing. You'll also remember back in the book of Enoch where all of these different spirits came down and taught them writing and taught them, uh, what do we have happening here in ancient Mesopotamia? <laughs> it's, it's literally confirming the book of Enoch in its own right, right? Book of Enoch says all these spirits came down and started teaching them things they didn't need to know. They weren't prepared to know. Let's take a look at the big dog here, because this is the big dog that you don't realize is in everything. So Ishtar, she's also Lilith. Um, Ishtar is among the most important, and she is. She's pretty much where you're getting all of this stuff from. She's, in, she's the big dog in ancient Mesopotamia. Is among the most important deities and the most important goddess in Mesopotamian pantheon. She is primarily known as the goddess of sexual love, but is equally prominent as the goddess of warfare in her astral aspect. Now, let's take a look at what demon really is. So, demon comes from the word daemon. Uh, I'll pull it up here in the Britannica, uh, Britannica Encyclopedia. Uh, Demon, also spelled daemon, classical Greek daemon in Greek religion, a supernatural power in Homer. The term is used almost interchangeably with theos. Theos in Greek is God, uh, theos for God. The, the distinction there is that theos emphasizes the personality of the God and demon, uh, and demon is activity. Hence, the term demon was regularly applied to sudden or unexpected supernatural uh, interventions, not due to any particular deity specifically. It became commonly uh, the power determining a person's fate, and a mortal could have a personal demon. Uh, as early as uh, Hassad, 700 BC, the dead of the Golden Age became demons, and later philosophical speculation en envisaged uh, these as lower than the gods, possibly mortal, but as superior to humanity. And then, and to go even further, when we get into the New Testament, they, everything just becomes evil. Okay, so now that we have a better understanding of what a demon is as a whole, we know that there are evil demons. No one's discrediting that, but that's not the way they were looked at during the, the Greek era and the Roman era. Why does it matter about the Roman era? Because that's the era that Jesus walked in. This is where your era of your New Testament is written in. Right? If we're going to listen to the New Testament, we might want to know some Greek mythology, as the world would call it, or as I like to call it, Greek history. Right? We might want to know what these things mean because we're going into a Greek written New Testament. And I always find it very important to know the culture. How can you know what they're writing about if you don't know the culture? Lilith is actually not a demon. It is many demons. Now, Lilith, uh, there are folklore stories about Lilith in Jewish uh, rabbinical texts. Um, and I'll try to remember some of them. I didn't post them all. Uh, but basically, uh, one of them is uh, the first creation. And you have two creation stories in Genesis. One of them is the first creation was Lilith and Adam. And, uh, and watch this. Watch what happens. She wanted to be on top. So I'm going to get dirty here, but this is, this is it, right? She wanted to be on top, but the male wanted to, the authority figure, right, wanted to be on top. And so they busted, they butt, butted heads, and she bailed and became what is known in the rabbinical text as the first wandering demon or wandering spirit outside of Eden. She left Eden. And in turn, the second creation, then God creates woman from, because in the first one, man and woman are created with done. The second one, woman is made from man, right? So the second creation now becomes Eve because the first one went fail. That's just another folklore, right? But Lilith isn't folklore. The story's written around her. Lilith actually goes all the way back to Ishtar uh, and uh, all the way back to the ancient Mesopotamia. 
Uh, and she is known as Lilithu. Uh, we'll pull her up here in the iconic right here. Uh, Lilith, female demonic figure of Jewish folklore. Her, her name and personality are thought to be derived from the class of Mesopotamian demons called Lilu, feminine Lilithu. And the name is usually translated as Night Monster. A cult associated with Lilith survived among the Jews. Hello? Um, so again, we haven't gone to the Bible. There, 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 there is none of these female demons and, and angels in the Bible until we get to this verse. Isaiah 34, 14. The wild beast of the desert shall also meet with the wild beast of the island, and the satire shall cry to his fellow, and the screech owl also shall rest there and find for herself a place of rest. Where's Lilith? How am I convincing you of anything? Did, did you see Lilith in there anywhere? Let's go to the Hebrew. And shall meet the wild beast of the desert with the jackals and the wild goat in its companion, the, the, the shall bleat. Also there shall rest the night creature and find for herself a place to, where'd the owl go? Uh-oh. Where, where'd the screech owl go? Oh no. And aren't owls Did that just become the night creature yeah. all of a sudden? Let's take a look at what the word night creature is in Hebrew. Click on that. Pretty sure that says Lilith, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what that says. Let's take a look. What's the definition of Lilith? Here, let me help you. What? I thought there were no female entities in the Bible. What is that? That says a female night demon, right? So there are female demons, and angels are spirits, and there are female angels also. That is a female. Lilith is in your Bible. That's clear as day. She is a demon. We've already proven that from Mesopotamia. The Lilithu, which are demons from Mesopotamia. We've already proven it. So to say that there are no female demons and entities or angels in the Bible, <laughs> it just means you missed it, right? That is Lilith, plain as day. No one can argue that one. Asherah. Who knows who Asherah is? Anyone here know who Asherah is? Okay. Asherah, we'll pull up here in the Britannica. Uh, there's a picture of her. Asherah, ancient West Semitic goddess, consort of the supreme god, um, which what you don't realize is El. It might actually tell you a little further here. Who's El? Well, we can go to the Old Testament. That becomes Elohim, right? That's the plural El. Um, so go a little further there. Ancient Semitic uh, goddess, consort and supreme god. Her principal effort was, pro was probably uh, she who walks on the sea. She was occasionally called Ilat or Ilet, the goddess, and may have also been called Kudu, holiness. Um, what you don't know is they also called her uh, uh, the, the queen of heaven is another term. In fact, I think she's even referenced in the Bible as the queen of heaven. Um, may have also been called Kudu, holiness according to the text, Ugarit, uh, uh, some of these words I hate to say. Asherah's consort was El, there it is. Her husband was El. And, and by him, she was the mother of 70 gods, as a mother goddess, she was widely worshipped throughout Syria and Palestine. She was frequently paired with Baal, who often took the place of El. Oh, look at this. Inscriptions from two locations in southern Palestine seem to indicate that she was also worshipped as the consort of who? Yahweh! Imagine that! So, here you have Yahweh and Asherah, or Asherah. Uh, here's some of the inscriptions that have been copied from ancient times. Uh, this is enthroned Yahweh and Asherah together in a throne. This is also Yahweh and his consort or his wife, Asherah. Uh, over here, you see her represented as a tree. Yahweh is the lion of Judah. So here's the lion and the tree goddess, right? It's the same thing over and over again. Here she is here. Uh, solar disc may represent Yahweh. That might be Yahweh up here is the solar disc God, but she is Asherah. And of course, Asherah is always going to be the goddess of fertility, goddess of love, goddess of blah, 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 blah. It's always the same thing. Uh, in fact, here we go. Uh, here's another inscription of her. And here's my little, oh, look, she's a tree, right? She's a tree, guys. They're all trees. This is what I'm trying to tell you. They're all trees in the garden. What God say? You can mingle with any of these trees, just not that one until they started worshiping them. And then it became a problem. So here she is represented as a tree. This is in Egypt. This has been going on for a long time. So 2 Kings 21.3. We're gonna see Asherah here. 
For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed, and he reared up altars for Baal and made a grove, and as did Ahab king of Israel, and worshipped all of the hosts of heaven, and worshipped all of the hosts of heaven. When we start worshipping all these other entities, when they all goes bad. Where's Asherah in this verse? Right? This is why it's so important that we always go back to the Hebrew. Guess what Asherah is? Can anyone guess what Asherah is before I go to the Hebrew in that verse? Mmm, the groves, the wooden image, no matter which version you do, right? Watch this, Hebrew. He raised up altars, Revol made a wooden image. Let's look at this wooden image. Who's that? That's Asherah, and here she is, a Phoenician goddess, also an image of the same, right? Because they would create an image to hope to bring their God back. They're worshiping in the name of this image, but they're trying to get the entity, is the, is the idea. Uh, and a lot of the Israelites worship them together. They actually felt that she was a consort to Yahweh. As you saw in the news article that I showed you, oh, God's wife has been written out of the Bible. We're God's wife. <laughs> That's what's going on here, right? So that's Asherah. Now, Greek demons. Uh, let's take a look at a couple of these. This is uh, this is a really good website. Uh, www.theo.com. Theo in the Greek means God, so God.com. Greek mythology. Here's their definition of Damien spirits. Damien's Damien's personified spirits of the human condition and abstract concepts formed a large part of the Greek pantheon of gods. Their names are simply capitalized nouns. So, for example, Eros is love. Then Teus is death, whatever. So the more you look, they're all female. Um, here we have Lisa, which is rage. <laughs> you didn't point out the Nike one. That's next. Yeah. <laughs> That's exactly what it says. So Nike, uh, which Nike was the winged goddess of victory, right? I've shown you, right? When we pull up the Olympian awards, right? The golden medal, look at what's on it. An angel. So it is the Nike angel. So here's another entity that has made its way into mainstream and everything you do today. Nike is just about on everything, your t-shirts, your everything, sponsorship, everything, you know what I mean? But like you said, it's the it's it's hiding Satan in, in, in plain sight is basically the idea. But Satan isn't your only bad guy. Satan is the bad guy that caused all of this to be a problem, but all these spirits are a problem, right? Yeah, absolutely, it absolutely does. All right, let's, uh, oh, here's your liberty. Libertas, right? In Roman religion, female personification of liberty and personal freedom. Well, who's that? <laughs> That's your Statue of Liberty. It's the icon of our country. Hello? Oh, I didn't have to go through all that. So, Pista Sophia. Anyone here know who Pista Sophia is? Uh, here, Pistas is the personified spirit, or daemona, of trust, honesty, and good faith. So, here we have the personified spirit of faith. Well, it doesn't sound so bad, right? Not so bad. Well, Sophia came out of Pistus. I'm, 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 again, it, you, to know all this, you're going to have to read some of these Gnostic texts, and they, they're easily achievable. Sophia comes out of Pistus. Well, what does the word Sophia mean? Wisdom. Put them together. Out of faith comes wisdom. Ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. This is in your Bible. Who's it talking about? Think about this deeply. You thought you knew what God created in the beginning, right? But here, Proverbs, this is Proverbs, this is in your Bible. Uh, ages ago, I was set up at the first, before the beginning of the earth. Number one, who's this talking? I was set up before the beginning of the earth. Who's this talking, right? All right, let's go a little further, 24. Uh, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Who is this entity? From the beginning, before there was water, before there were depths, before there was earth, right? Is this clear? 25. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. But watch this. Before he had made the earth and the fields, before he had made the earth and the fields, before God, so this isn't God speaking, so who is it? Well, now we have a dilemma, right? 
Who is this? Is this isn't God? Because it's referencing being there when God created everything. Do this. We just keep going. You don't want to think Proverbs is dedicated to this entity. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree, so whatever that entity was, we split the sea and it Tiamat. became the Tiamat, right? When he gave his decree to the sea, that personified spirit, and it split the oceans and created the earth and the, right? So that the waters would not surpass his command when he appointed the foundations of the earth. I mean, this spirit's making it clear when, when, when this spirit was involved. Uh, then I was by him and brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. Who is this entity that is talking directly to you and making it very clear that it's not God? I was with God. All right, let's go back to the notes here. Since we're just uh, barely not getting anywhere here. We're going to jump all the way back before I started reading to you. Does not wisdom... Who's wisdom? Hmm. Does not Sophia cry and understanding put forth her voice? Uh-oh, what's going on here? Is this Sophia? Wisdom, the personified wisdom? Sophia is a female goddess. The personification of wisdom. Is there any other further evidence that shows personification spirits in the, in the Bible, the entire Bible? <laughs> I, you want me to click on all of these? Because I will. Like, <laughs> entire, I'll click every one of them, don't you dare me. <laughs> That's all in the Bible here. I got little references. We don't have to click them all. Can you Mark, put those in the... Oh, I'll have everyone in there, yep. Mark 9, 17, the mute spirit, the spirit of mute, spirit of not talking, right? Uh, Mark 9, 27, deaf and mute spirit, right? You're, you're wishing not, oh, careful what spirit you play with. <laughs> careful what spirit you personify, okay? Jokes uh, can be deadly. Matthew 12, 22, the blind and mute spirit. Uh, Acts 16, 16, the divination spirit. Uh, witchcraft. Uh, 1 John 4, 6, spirit of error. 1 Timothy 4, 1, seducing spirits. Are there personified spirits in your Bible? Or is everyone just lying? <laughs> is everyone just lying? These are personified spirits. The personification of lying, right? The lying spirit. Yahweh sends out lying spirits in the mouth of prophets. Are they personified? Oh, they are. And they're real entities, right? Yeah, like when they say like they're casting out spirits of sickness, it's not just a turn of phrase. Right, you know. right, exactly. Like God has given you the authority to cast out demons. Demons are all these things. Everything is ran by these things. 